Um, so um, welcome everyone and thank you for coming to the discussion of the 2040 movie organized by Plant, uh, which stands for People Learning About Nature and Tayport, uh, which is a Tayport Community Trust subgroup. And we rerun a community garden and associated projects in Tayport and the screening of the movie and all of our current work at the moment is funded from a Scottish Government Climate Challenge Fund. Um, my name is Kashka Hempel and uh, I'll be your host for the evening. Uh, my role in the project is as a blog and carbon conversation coordinator for plant. Um, and um, I just wanted to say a few words to um, maybe provide the general context, more specific context for um, for the movie discussion, because obviously the movie is made in the in Australia and aimed globally, but um, we will be talking about its relevance here in our community. And so we all know um, we're experiencing climate emergency uh, that was highlighted at the uh, beginning of the movie, and experts tell us that we are indeed at the threshold of a critical decade to truly transform how we live in order to prevent a catastrophe which will result from our planet heating up beyond 1.5 to 2 degrees at the end of the century. Um, so um, we need to take action now and we need to take action fast to stem the carbon emissions from, our, from our, all our activities. Um, I think we're quite lucky here in Scotland and the UK um, where government at least seems to recognize the urgency um, of the situation. Um, both UK and Scottish government declared climate emergency last year. It feels like it's been decades since last year, um, but uh, it was only last year that they did that. Um, and that was quickly followed by a legal obligation of in increasing the uh, carbon emission cutting commitments um, to zero carbon target for Scotland for, by 2045 and UK government um, carbon target by zero carbon target by 2050. So at least in theory, we on our way there. Um, just to talk about plant and what we've been doing, we've been working um, with funding from a Climate Challenge Fund, which is aimed at grassroots action, uh, community-based projects here in Scotland. Um, and we've, a lot of our projects have climate, climate in mind. Um, so uh, we've got Tayport Community Garden, which uh, produces local produce, but also upskills people to grow their own. We're reducing waste through uh, using um, surplus apples from Tayport Gardens. And over the last couple of years, we also run carbon conversation workshops for households to help families take action on climate themselves. Uh, and I can tell you loads about how much carbon we saved because we had to count it all to report to our funders. But, um, and we did uh, save quite a lot of emissions from all these activities. But I think the most important thing and I think a lot of people involved in the project will agree with me on this. The most important thing is really bringing people together uh, around um, these matters, because really, to be honest, we're not going to be able to do anything individually. Um, we need to act together as a community and support each other in, in taking action. And that's, I think, to me, the most valuable aspect of the work we do here. And on top of all this, we have a pandemic, of course, um, that hit us earlier this year. Um, and there's been quite a lot of debate about whether it's a hindrance or opportunity in terms of um, acting on climate emergency. Um, there's been a lot of talk about um, uh, implementing Green New Deals to bring back better economy that's more yeah. equitable um, for all. Um, hopefully that, that, that will happen. So this Lots of interesting stuff floating out there um, locally and um, globally, and lots of distressing stuff as well uh, with the climate emergency and the lockdown, the pandemic, and potential economic um, uh, result from that. Um, and we thought the movie would be an inspiration for us all to, to think um, or imagine what we can be doing as a community individually to, 
to bring about um, a better future for everybody. So um, that's enough of me. Uh, uh, we invited three lovely people to help us kick off the discussions around the movie um, uh, as a panel. Um, and now I'm going to introduce them now. We've got um, Anna Moss, who, uh, whose climate change research background stretches from the micro level of soil invertebrate ecology to the global impacts on international NGOs and corporations. And for the last eight years, she has provided research-led advice to Scottish government on adapting to climate change to enable us to understand what actions should be taken, monitor what is being done, and evaluate whether this is ensuring uh, the resilience of Scotland's environment, communities, infrastructure, and economy. So a lot on her plate. She's also a Taypot resident, a mum, and is involved in running Taypot Top Park Group. And our next panelist is Rona McCallum, and she's lived in Taypot since 1993 and retired from her career in, in the NHS and social work in 2011. And being retired has given her opportunity to become more involved with the community. And she's currently chair of the Dolphin Center and Taypot Amateur Dramatic and Musical Society. And as a keen gardener, Rona is interested to know how Taypot can contribute to adapting to climate change. And Rona lives um, with her Westie, Mami, and lives in Taypot, of course. And last but not least is Andrew Allen, who is an interim, interim director of the UNESCO Center of, for Water Law, Policy and Science at the University of Dundee. And his areas of expertise include national legal frameworks for water resource management, climate change adaptation, flooding, irrigation and stakeholder engagement. And he's a dad of three and lives in Taypot with his family. So that's the panelists and um, uh, I would like to welcome them all and thank them for um, joining us today. So as I said, you'd be able to actually ask questions uh, and Helena will facilitate um, uh, that part of um, uh, the discussion. You can use chat to type your questions into uh, and you can also just type uh, letter H for hand up to uh, indicate you would like to ask a question and we'll um, uh, and um, you, we will, um, Helena will call, a, call on you in turn and you'll be able to unmute yourself to ask the question or if you prefer to remain anonymous, uh, in, you would like her to ask the question instead, uh, please um, put an asterisk at the start uh, of your question to let us know. Uh, and uh, if you wanting to direct your question to a specific panelist, please um, uh, indicate their name in, in next to the question as well. So, um, right, I think I'm going to kick us off. Um, and this is a question to all of the panelists. Um, if you can respond to that. Um, for a long time now, the conversation around the climate crisis has focused on the problems and not the solutions, uh, as was pointed out in the movie. Uh, which solutions from the film do you find most appealing and relevant to our community here in Tayport uh, and sort of our region, Northeast Fife, uh, right now? And what should we sink our teeth into? What can we start doing right now to make a difference? Um, and maybe there, there isn't anything on the, that was offered in the movie and maybe there's something missing. So if, you, if there's something missing, maybe point to that solution as well. Um, Anna, would you like to start us off? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think the, the strongest example is always going to be those ones that we can really imagine embracing. So, I mean, obviously we had some fantastic examples in the film, but I think the ones that kind of perhaps really resonate are the ones that either are already operating in towns and cities that we that seem familiar to us um, or ones where um, um, we can easily see how it would fit into our existing lives. Um, I think this is one of the problems when you're looking at behavioral change is kind of recognizing that um, making this change is always going to be harder if people feel like they're losing something. 
So it's, uh, I think, the examples where you can really imagine them fitting into your own life and perhaps not actually losing those things you already value. So when you're looking at uh, renewable energy and even looking at these kind of community energy schemes, which was just fantastic, um, you can see that actually that means you can continue to utilise all the, the, the things that those home comforts, because um, you wouldn't actually be losing that energy source, you could still consume that energy. I think the harder ones uh, to see those behavioural changes in, in locations like ours are the ones where it, it would be a big rate step to change, so particularly around transport. So you, there you need to ensure that there, um, it's a very coherent procedure that means that that infrastructure is there to, to ensure that those new ways of moving are, are comfortable and cheap and accessible and much more favourable than our current system of our own personal cars, for example. Did you have any of the did any of the solutions in the movie like particularly excited you though? I Is think there anything what, that appealed personally to you? Um, I think if, particularly to thinking about tapeport specifically and, and things that we could introduce really quite rapidly. I think the, the issues around education and awareness um, were really important. And I think of that example where they, I can't think what the name of the, the location was now, where they, they, um, they actively displayed um, their carbon emissions and it was kind of, you know, you could see that on a, on a rolling daily basis. And that got, um, um, you know, it was in places of work and it was in the school and it became part of a general part of the conversation. And I think that's really critical that people have the right information in the right way um, so they, they can be informed and be able to make those decisions, whether that comes down to food labelling or something that we can in, instigate in our own community, potentially. Um, I mean, I mean, can, can I things. just add in there? I think, yeah, you need to do like different variety of mediums to get that information out, like visual, written, you know, all that sort of stuff. So I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. Um, if, if we can hold the discussion um, oh, uh, to later I was just wanting to no don't don't worry Ali it's just I wanted to for the panelists to comment first and then we can take it forward there's 34 people so it's uh, it's a bit tricky to have a, an open discussion um, thanks Anna um, Rona would you like to comment on on uh, on the same question um yeah I, I um particularly liked the uh, I don't know, called it the honeycomb thing with the energy, you know, the electricity or, or, or whatever, because I, I, I've, the idea of actually being able to give any excess electricity to my next door neighbour instead of the grid seemed really appealing to me. Um, and um, just, if, you know, I don't know whether that's something that we as a community could, could do, but I certainly think that um, you know, we would find it more interesting you know, and more, more acceptable perhaps than some of the things that we're doing just now. Um, and, and like Anna, I particularly liked the example of the, the graphics and, and how they explained how um, the, you know, the children who didn't see the graphics seemed to, that they were saying, you know, I would do this, whereas the ones that did said that, you know, we would do this, they were seeing it as a community thing and that, it, it, was, it was something that belonged to all of them, which I thought was really interesting. Thank you, um, Rana. Well, how, how about you, Andrew? Sorry, I was on mute. Yeah, okay. I, well, I, I echo what's been said already. I, I, um, I thought the community dashboard thing looked like a really good idea. It was interesting to see the response. Um, I think the, given the, the development of the Larix and said, a good time to have something like that up. How people would respond to it individually, I don't know. Um, people people have a mixed response, I think, um, in terms of uh, whether or not they'll respond to uh, I don't know high high consumption, only reduce their consumption. Um, be interesting to see how that might work in reality. Uh, I also like the idea of the energy sh energy sharing, the grids that they had in Bangladesh. Um, how that would work again in, in Tapert would be 
probably more difficult, I think you could do something based on savings that people could make, and then you could pass that on somehow to somebody else in the community, maybe. Um, I know that there's already, when I mean, you mentioned plant and the activities at the community garden, I thought that the idea of they brought in food miles um, was good. I thought that one of the other things that maybe as a kind of tangential issue was the dialogue with farmers here in terms of the, the sustainability of the agricultural practices in Tapor and the, the area around it. Don't know how good that dialogue is currently. It would be interesting to know what efforts farmers were actually taking to, to be more sustainable. Some of the, the questions that came up in the, um, the film were not appropriate for Tapor because they're on a much larger scale and probably US focused more than, than um, certainly in UK. The other thing I, I liked, and I don't know if this is potentially or possible at all, was the seaweed, the, perm, the marine permaculture. My, my kids loved the idea, and I wasn't, I wasn't entirely convinced that if you scaled it up, it would still have much, make much difference. But I did think we have the sea on our doorstep. Seaweed's great. Could we do something here? That would be interesting. Um, I think that's probably me just now, yeah. Uh, just coming, it's coming on the, the farming issue that, that Andrew raised there. So I've done engagement with local primary school and things and uh, around in, in that case was looking at climate change adaptation and farming. And it was quite interesting then uh, talking with the children about climate change and farming around our, our, our small community. And they were quite, quite quickly picked up on some of the issues. So where we were talking about the importance of of keeping, um, of, of um, not completely stripping uh, the land at certain times of the year to prevent soil erosion and things and, and improve the condition of the soil. Uh, quite a few of them were really quick to point out that like, oh yeah, you know, when you drive from, um, um, from Lucas, there's like a road there that gets covered um, with you know, the soil and sand blows across the road. And, and they recognize really quickly that in the, their own environment, they could see these, these issues that were very related to climate change and they could see it and, but they hadn't made that link before. And that was really quite interesting. And I think sort of capitalizing on that and making people realize um, that how the climate change is already impacting on their own environment is, is really important. Mm -hmm. um, do we have any questions from the audience yet? Does anybody want to ask a question? No one has typed any in the, um, chat i don't know if everyone's aware that you can get to the chat just by clicking the chat button like a little speech bubble and if you want to type anything oh tina would like to um make a comment or ask a question tina are you okay to do that yeah, yeah. hi there um yeah just a bit, some some quick things that have popped up um uh <sighs> Um, I suppose there's loads of things that you can say, but one of the things about the the education and the the awareness, um, I suppose that, that this is maybe the the most controversial thing of of what I was thinking about when I when I saw the film was um, how um, the fine line between educating and kind of brainwashing what we what we what we what we think so there's a lot of the children that were kind of regurgitating what obviously what they had you know kind of been told um, and I think I mean I know that that um, and that's why I, I really love what you're saying about the children made that connection really quickly about the fields and that the you know allowing them that space to kind of bring you know bring out and to kind of engage in that way with with what they are seeing and what they can connect with I think is really really important and um, this is probably a, wee, a little aside to that and I know that the film had deliberately chosen to look at the solutions that we already are, we are already working with and we already know um, but I, I think that and, and that's wonderful because the film was so positive and so uplifting but I think also it's limiting as well because think of all the things that we didn't know existed and the light bulb and the the you know the airplanes and I think to say we can only work with I mean I know that the the, the film was trying to say um, you know what, what can we do with what we already know but I think encouragement of thinking 
bigger create you know thinking imaginatively of you know like that girl with the rocket boots you know the fact i mean thomas edison himself inventing the light bulb was so clear about what he wanted to invent and it was a crazy idea it was like crazy at the time and i think encouraging that but i just wanted to add that and and actually one of the questions um to you anna was um when you said that it's difficult to make big behavioral changes you know and that's why we have to kind of do things that are kind of more comparable to what we you know we could kind of currently fit into our lives i think i i suppose i'm the question that i have on that is do you think um possibly that within the culture and the the situation that we are in at the moment with coronavirus and the fact that we've had like enormous behavioral change this is like an amazing opportunity for us to really um to really kind of go further than we might have been wanting to go before because it would have been too big a leap then now whereas now it's maybe not so big a leap for us that we've been in this situation anyway i won't go on anymore but i just wanted to ask these anna would you like to i think your name was mentioned in the question yeah um Kashka, are you happy for me to, <laughs> to jump in there yeah so, yeah it's fine um yeah the covid and the um more transfer transformational changes can yeah yeah i mean i th i think that's been quite interesting over the last uh few months with people having to get used to um i wouldn't like to say a new normal because i don't believe it is a new normal but i i see um having to get used to uh, a different way of living i think has brought home a lot of um a lot of things to people so i think then the positives to take from that um are I think a lot of people and companies um, in certain sectors have realized that actually this way of working from home is much more easy than they thought. Obviously, we run into technical difficulties quite often as well. But, you know, the potential to to have team meetings uh, and the creative, some of the creativity that has come up because of this as well. So people realizing that you can do events like this online. Mm -hmm. And you can even have international conferences, more importantly, um, effectively online, um, which is great in terms of um, avoiding all, all those air miles, of course. Um, and so hopefully some of that innovation and positivity will remain and encourage um, the um, encourage people away from that com commuting lifestyle, um, at least in part to recognize and companies can you know, then embrace the fact that people can homework um, very effectively and obviously that has knock-on benefits from um, you know, family life um, and things as well. Um, I think as well in terms of the, the sort of pandemic, I think one of the positives that I hope will remain as well has been seeing how quickly the, um, um, the, the use of, of science has been up there up front, the, the importance of the policy being science-led has been right in our faces with all the press briefings and things. And I would really be really keen for that um, positive connection between the importance of policy being science led and research led um, remains the, the importance of, of, um, of, of understanding what the models are telling us and, um, um, and actually following them rather than, than uh, ignoring them. Uh, um, and, and acting in a timely fashion, again, is a really critical lesson we need to take, um, as governments need to take from this. Yeah, certainly within the climate, climate um, action, science, science is not always at the forefront, so hopefully that will rub off. Um, um, Andrew, would you like to add anything to this? Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of that COVID link, to me, I mean, I agree with everything Anna just said, um, but it will be interesting to see um, how the pendulum swings, because I get the impression looking at the carbon, the rise in carbon emissions since um, lockdown has been uh, kind of relieved in some countries is a bit uh, worrying. But I do think that because it looks like everybody's just going back to business as usual. But I think that's partly to do with the fact that um, the consequences of the of the COVID have not been fully absorbed yet, and I think that people will take time to change their plans, 
look at how property um, in city centres works, for example. Um, look at how they have to manage their businesses in a way that can reduce travel and allow people to stay at home much more. So I, I hope that we'll see a pendulum swing back at the moment, but then over the longer term, a realisation that there is another way of working that's much more sensible. I think people have seen the benefits of, um, uh, well, not, I mean, not benefits of staying home, but certainly the benefits of nature in a way that they weren't seeing before. That was one of the things I liked about the film, that it wasn't just about climate change, it was a bit more climate change plus. Um, the role of nature, the importance of biodiversity, which doesn't often or doesn't always come into the debates about climate change. Um, and I think it's really important to see that plus the food aspects um, in there. So uh, how, it will, how it will respond, how the, the post-COVID world will look from a climate change perspective, I think there'll be a settling off period, I hope. And then, and then hopefully things will change because there'll be much more of a chance to plan. Rona, would you like to comment on that as well? Yeah, I think, you know, from the, I suppose the thing about the COVID um, situation is that, you know, from a community perspective, um, I feel that the, you know, Tapor has proved what, you know, most of us knew already that we've all pulled together and that, um, you know, the five council helpline service is never needed for Tapor because we all just manage ourselves, which is, you know, you kind of think you shouldn't we capitalize on that, you know, and, and mm. encourage the community um, to move forward on this. And, you know, things like as well, you know, local shops and we are starting to shop locally, which, you know, is presumably reducing our footprint as well. And whether that's not something we can't maintain, um, you know, as we slowly work our way out of this, you know. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, from, from a community perspective, we're in a good place, if you like, to perhaps encourage people to think a wee bit differently. Mm, that all sounds very encouraging. Can um, I just come, come in on yeah, that, that community yeah. thing as well? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's really highlighted those, as you say, Rona, those kind of support networks um, and, um, and people sharing resources as well. Um, and I think it's really highlighted so that the importance of partnerships, whether it's resilience around pandemics or it's resilience around climate change, the importance of partnerships within the community and between the public and private sector and communities is really critical for general resilience as a whole, whatever mm -hmm. you're trying to deal with. And so hopefully, you know, some of that is going to be that recognition is going to be built on as we yeah, and the networks are going to be maintained and strengthened. Yeah, that's quite a positive thing. Um, do we have any more questions, Helena? Yes, we do. Yep. Georgia RG has um, put their hand up. Hi. Would you like to oh, unmute? Yep. Hello. Yeah. Hello. So the, the question is really Andrews. I'm Georgia. This is Andrew. Yeah, so my question pretty much is direct to the, the Hive solar power system. Now, I don't know if you guys will know the answer to this, but it could be a further topic for conversation. Whether that kind of system in Scotland or in the UK in general is actually legal. Obviously, it was highlighted in the video that in some places that kind of thing might be illegal. Obviously, the government might not want us profiting off of something that they can make money from. But I, I, that's my question. Do, I, do anybody here know if something like that would be legal within this country? Um, sorry, if I may add, um, I've only been in Tapor for the last three years, but I was asking people around, um, I was asking about solar panels because I was looking into it and if there was any government funds to help with that, etc. And somebody said to me that there used to be some kind of project by the government that people could get solar panels and then they were able to feed into the grid and into the grid and then they used to get some kind of monetary benefit out of that i don't know if that was a thing or and then um for everything you said um i agree with with everything and with covid that was said before us i think that we are able to change our behavior really fast and when people are told what the problem is you know in simple terms and what they need to do to move forward they will do it um, I don't think the government has done that regarding to, to climate change or any government has done that. Um, but that's, you know, um, free to interpretation, I suppose. 
And then I was wondering whether as a community we could get in touch with the universities. I don't know, um, because that could be an opportunity to create something like Hive in a smaller scale with students. We have two universities in Dundee or St. Andrews, I don't know. Yeah, I think we can and do um, the other thing I wanted to say is that I know that there is a community garden and I have visited it and it's amazing. Um, and um, it's good to see more people growing their own food and having gardens, etc. And I know that the community has been working on that. Has there ever been like um, a local market? Um, maybe people who grow their own food. We do that. I come from Greece, you see. And um, in our community, every single um, Wednesday, for example, um, we have a street in our village and whoever grows their own food and has access, we all meet together and we share food. Exchange. So I don't know if that would be an idea. <laughs> but yes, that's it from us, thank you. I've got a question that someone's asked me, or a statement that someone's asked me to read out, um, saying that there is a local electricity bill which is before Parliament at the moment, which is to allow local selling of surplus electricity, um, and that you can get details on power for people dot org dot uk i'll put that in the chat the website that's the hive question does anybody oh, um hi. from the panel know anything more about these ne energy networks that can comment on that uh, not, I'm no expert on it at all, but I know that there has been uh, a lot of funded by the Scottish Government into community energy um, projects. And I know you do run into issues given that energy is um, uh, not fully devolved, it's a bit of a complex one, so obviously yeah. it's, it's still largely reserved. So there are issues around, um, you know, legal issues that need to be resolved at not just Scottish Government level, but UK level. Um, and in terms of the um, um, uh, there, there used to be um, um, a lot fun, more funding or kind of the um, kind of, uh, financial benefits of um, installing your own renewable that the UK government then stopped their funding of, I believe. But I'm, I'm not a particular expert on that area. so I didn't. Uh, If you want to find out about energy and including installing renewable energy solutions for your home, um, Home Energy Scotland, just Google that. I know they've got all the information about current um, subsidies and funding for individuals. I, I have um, that, thank you. Yep. There's also a comment, Tansy, are you okay if I read this one out? Um, that there's ESQCR electricity supply quality and connectivity regulations um, which would make it difficult at the moment to do because they are very restrictive of who can be a supplier. So complicated but maybe it's going yeah. to be resolved. Yeah. Um, okay I've got one more comment from somebody here. Um, can we make this a last one because yeah. um, we, yeah, we're, uh, running we yeah, we're running short on time. So. Okay, Isambard, do you want to read that one out? No, it's not unmuting. I'll start and if they unmute and join in, I'll let them take over. Um, it says that um, they've said, you could argue that worrying about overly influencing young people, for example, in schools, has actually held us back. The same issue has been present with teachers worrying about teaching the issues about diversity, um, gender, race, disability, sexuality, etc., which has led us to the problems we're seeing today. Big corporations do not worry about the messages they give. Teachers should feel it is okay to teach this because of the science base, and we can all encourage teachers to do this. So I guess that's going back to the... Um, having everyone feel like they're involved in the in climate change and how they can act community sort of aspect of things and that the um having it on our dashboard okay i think that's actually all. there was a, a hand up kirsty's got a hand up in the all right oh, sorry, i haven't seen that kirsty i mean um that would be kirsty um Kirsty and um, uh, yeah. yep. It's both of us, really. Yep, yep. Um, 
we were we were um, radical students right on there eh, back in the early 80s when we were members of students against nuclear energy and we researched all the stuff about um, fluidized bed combustion of coal carbon capture and you know we got quite into it and uh, resisted the Tornest power station and uh, got big petitions on Chernobyl um, before it went off. Um, this is like what goes around comes around. And the one big thing that I got from the film tonight was the fact that um, renewal, renewable energy technology was going to expand brilliantly because I remember as part of our um, student activities, we used to boycott Rio Tinto Zinc, who had very, very iffy mining practices and, mm. you know, the way that they treated their workers and stuff. And the whole renewable energy thing relies on the mining of vanadium. Now, I've researched this and um, it makes battery life so much more long for capturing wind energy, solar energy, you know, all the alternatives. But the question has to be asked, what's happening with geopolitics, precious metals, countries buying the precious metals up and storing them? You know, there's a whole manner of stuff beyond the technology that needs to be tackled as part of this whole issue and the way that we're thinking about it. And um, Kirsty inspired me from year zero by being a subscriber to the new internationalist magazine. So, yes, we're two old hippies, and you know, long, <laughs> live, <laughs> long live the hippiedom. Uh, it's, does anybody have any comment on that? Um, I guess it's sort of looking into. Um, not creating more problems when, when, when we deploying solutions. Yeah, I mean, this is always a, a massive issue, one of maladaptation, whether it's at a local level or whether you're talking globally. And yeah, I mean, energy storage, as, as uh, you pointed out, is, is, is a really critical issue that needs to be, uh, in, is a technology that needs to be advanced if we're going to ensure that we have the energy storage, storage um, um, energy stored in the way that we can access it for whether it's for electric vehicles or, or whatever and it does create these these big issues around um, raise these big issues around um, precious metals that are currently being um, being mined in in uh, countries in very inhumane ways in terms of um, both in terms of the treatment of the workforce but also in terms of the environmental degradation associated with them and it's yeah it's absolutely critical that that is not lost amongst the um the the great advances and the you know it's great to see that uh i mean and what's critical is you need um these big corporations and these um extractive industries to be um moving away to what they see as being more profitable which is obviously into, into renewables and energy storage and things um and because they're not going to do it out of the goodness of their heart, they need to do it because it's going to be profitable and they, they can't end up with these stranded old industries. Um, but it needs to be done in a way, um, as Peter pointed out, that is not causing maladaptation. Yeah. Andrew, do you have um, anything but quickly to add? Because uh, you've got no, international I, perspectives. I the, only, the only things I would say quickly is that... Um, in terms of the geopolitics that Peter mentioned, um, I think that to me that's the note of caution on the, the favourable um, kind of message that was given about renewables. In Scotland, the renewable situation is much better than a number of other many other countries. But um, I think the the thing to bear in mind is that there are pressures that are, um, or countries there are countries like China, for example, which are building um, coal-fired and fossil fuel-powered. Um, power stations, sorry, um, jet, uh, yeah, fossil um, power stations that require fossil fuels um, and coal, and so all these things are going on, and these are these are kind of in the pipeline now, and so the I think that reduces the pers the, the prospect um, to some extent of uh, a complete um, 
takeover of, of renewables. It's not an area I know an awful lot about, but um, I get the impression working in Bangladesh, for example, you, the Chinese are building a big coal fire power station on the coast. Mm. Um, and it gives nice access for China to the Indian Ocean, for example. It's the closest point to the Indian Ocean for China. So there are other things that are going on here. And the only other thing I would mention is the, the you mentioned precious metals. Um, I think for me, the, the, the other question about is, is rare earth metals, so many of which are needed for mobile phones, for example. And there are two main areas where you can get them, China and under the sea. So one of the big things that's going to happen now is you're going to have, you're going to have much more deep sea mining for these kind of things because they're so valuable and it becomes cost effective to go down to great depths, for example, near Papua New Guinea to get these minerals. Um, so that's, sorry, it's another, I find it very difficult not to be negative, but um, it was a very positive film, but there's always um, these considerations. Uh, you know, right, swings yeah. and roundabouts on this. Thanks. Yeah, we have to be not too overly optimistic. We have to take caution about um, yeah where we're going with everything, aren't we? Um, and before we split into the rooms, I thought because there's lots of ideas sort of buzzing about. Um, uh, I thought we could take a couple of minutes to um, digest and think about those um, ideas and and consolidate some some vision in our minds. And because you're probably tired of my voice, I chose to use um, a video by um, Bob Hopkins, uh, who's a key player in Transition Towns Movement. And he's just recently published an inspiring book uh, called From What Is to What If on how to create delicious memories of our future by asking creative what if questions. Um, so if we you just um, that will just walk you through imagining um, um, a future and just focus on on listening to it and we'll take it from there so I'm just going to share that hopefully that will work and open this and play is that we're going to travel forward 10 years to 2030 and the world that we're going to uh, arrive in is not utopia but it is a world in which we have done absolutely everything that we could possibly do everything that could have been done during those 10 years that the climate change the science the urgency demanded of us we did with compassion with focus with patience with dedication it's a future where um so like I say, it, 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 it's not paradise, but it is a future where everything we could possibly have done was done. That over that time, there was cascades of positive change that built and multiplied and magnified in a way that in 2020 felt, felt completely unimaginable. And people in the future will look back at those extraordinary people between 2020 and 2030 and the bravery and the guts they showed and the imagination and the vision. And they sing great songs and tell great stories about what happened during that time when everything was reimagined and rebuilt and there was a huge sense of collective purpose. So I'd like to invite you to close your eyes. And what we're going to do in a minute is we're going to turn on our, uh, the time machine. And when we turn on that time machine, we'll be traveling forward uh, to 2030. And when we get there, I would just invite you to take a walk around in that world using your imagination with all of its senses. What does that world that you're in smell like and feel like and sound like? What do you see uh, around you? What's it like to walk down a street? What's the, what does daily life feel like? What are the children doing? Just allow yourself to walk down those streets, to breathe the air, to listen and see what you can hear. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, just to kind of really immerse yourself in that way. Okay, so I'm gonna turn on my time machine now and then we'll just go forward and spend a couple of minutes uh, with you wandering around uh, in that world.
So keeping your eyes closed, I would just invite you to return to the, to the reality of 2020, but to bring with you and to just think about what are the what if questions that bubble up for you from that. Things that you saw there, things that you experienced there, things that you felt there. What are the what if questions that, that provide a bridge for us? from now in 2020 to thinking forward uh, into that future. And we back. Um, I hope that sort of helped everybody um, visualize things a bit better. Um, I need to get rid of this thing now. Uh, and before we split up, um, I wanted to pose um, the questions we, uh, we would like to maybe focus on in the smaller groups. So um, do a very quick go around with introductions uh, of one sentence, uh, your name, where you're based, and maybe your feeling uh, about um, uh, the movie or the future you just imagined, just one fra phrase or one word. Um, and the main question is really to share one thing that which was the most powerful thing that came to your mind about the future when you were trying to imagine our communities in 2030 or 2040 whatever it was for you and why explain to people maybe why that was the most powerful thing for you and then if we get around to it we can also talk about what would be the first thing you're going to do tomorrow or your community has to do tomorrow to, to make a first step towards that future to towards that one thing that was the most powerful and that you might, the thing you imagined i hope that makes sense this these uh, questions will pop up in your rooms as, as we split up um so um kaylee why don't you take us into the rooms and hopefully that's going to work welcome back i think that's everybody back kaylee is that right Yes, that's right. Fantastic. Um, so I hope that was quite interesting talking to each other about our visions of the future. Um, perhaps we'll have like one sentence of the most um, exciting idea from your room um, to go around, around the facilitators, if that's okay. I'm going to start and I have to work out what our most exciting thing was. I really liked the, uh, we had lots of different uh, visions um, but I really liked Andrew's um, idea about allotments everywhere for Tayport because makes food, food growing visible, uh, makes it accessible to everybody and it would really transform the town um, for us. So that's our thought for the day. Um, so uh, we were in room number five. How about room number one? Can the facilitator from room number one unmute yourself, please? Because we all muted. <laughs> Who was in um, room number one? Me. Oh, was Ali? Yeah, excellent. Um, Just one we, thought. We ended the conversation on we need to stay positive and not think of too much of a negative, but positive. And it's about education. Education right from the word go. Um, with, with with kids, young people, you know, it's keeping it there and also keeping it real. Um, I don't know if any of my group wants to interact. I was trying frantically to write things down. We could have gone on for hours, really. To yes, be it's, it's 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 almost never <laughs> ending yeah, conversation. Um, we'll just keep it really brief just now. Yeah, and hopefully for the education. Summaries. Yeah, education. Yeah. So room number two was. Um, That's me, cool. Kasia. Um, Thanks, Jesse. I, uh, we had a great conversation, four of us, um, quite a lot about the reduction in traffic, um, uh, things like car clubs to reduce the number of cars on the road, driverless cars, electric cars, um, community energy scheme, uh, there's an example up near the Hutton Institute apparently, so we could look into how that's been done, importance involving primary school kids and then Right at the end, we talked a lot about food and um, sustainable farming methods, which are important. And um, the idea of local markets, we're really keen on the idea of 
of um, perhaps using the Larrick Center or elsewhere to, to not only have locally um, produced food commercially, but also sh sharing um, produce amongst the community. And um, yeah, so that's about it, I think. That's fantastic. Thank you, Jesse. Um, so that was number two. Number three? Uh, that, that was me. Um, so um, we, we, we talked a lot about the film, but we also related it to, to lockdown as well. Um, and we reflected on both the, um, the Tapor and St Andrews community um, and what lockdown has looked like for us, and um, particularly looking at community um, and how people have been re have really come together um, and also been a lot more social, a lot more, you know, looking outward when we were out on walks. We've noticed a lot more people saying hello, and a lot more um, communication, you know, when just when we're out and about. And we really uh, reflected on wanting to kind of keep that, that strong community um, sense um, and, and to use that um, from, to move from COVID in, into back into climate change. Lovely, thank you. Uh, number four. Who was the number four facilitator? That's, that's me. Yeah. Jim. So we had a, a, a wonderful discussion. Um, we had representation from Devon and Celadikes and two from Table. So that was that was pretty amazing, and um, we we did discuss the film a little bit. And one of the things we 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 somewhat agreed on was that there's a there's a certain perspective that perhaps is from the Australian idea there, and it there could have been a a a, broad, a, a broader discussion on the the accessibility for some of these solutions to different uh, communities with different levels of wealth. Mm. And, uh, and and capability there, um, and the the big idea is that there there were a couple um, very strong ideas. I mean, basically, it was, there was the education of, of kids, but it was barefoot, barefoot children who are, are learning whilst doing. So they are they're growing and and learning to cook the food they grow, and learning to understand and respect and and engage with the environment that supports them. And uh, there was also a very strong um, element of this, this aspect of trying to make sure that actually communities, uh, all areas of communities are, are brought into this. So that uh, people who are more disadvantaged, who cannot uh, spend time with their children, um, their children are still getting that same care and attention and getting that same experience and bringing it back to them perhaps. Um, and uh, I think that that was that was about it. I mean, the the, the last thing was really uh, trying to get over the discussions of, of small talk and getting into getting people to talk about the real problems that mm. Being, mm. everybody can address together in their community. Great, thanks, Jim. Uh, was there group number six or room number six? Yeah, that was me. Okay. Well, that, was okay. thing, that wasn't just me. That was my. Group. It was just you. <laughs> <laughs> so all my group were from um, really local. I think all of them were from Tayport or uh, certainly living there now. Um, so we had a, a, a. We started off the discussion really about the film and what we found meaningful or impactful. Um, and I think the sort of the key things that were coming through very much from all of the group was. Um, the amazing way that we can educate and empower women across the globe um, and how powerful this, what potential this has to creating a more even and really we, we, we touched on a just society. Um, and you know, how, what that can bring to the table. And when we talked about just societies and just transitions, we then sort of brought it back down to Scotland. Um, and we said, you know, the impacts of climate change and the, the, the changes that are potentially are going to happen around this, the things, the changes we need to make as, as a society here, um, can affect people disproportionately. So it's, you know, there's a, we didn't have time to go into a really detailed discussion about what a just transition really means, but that certainly was on our, uh, on our agenda and, and an important point that we wanted to bring forward. And then in terms of, um, 
realizing the vision and how we can make this happen uh, you know within Taple and the local area um I guess there's like two quite strong voices that came out here um, one was around local farming and agricultural agriculture at a local level and you know this is even just community growing but also turning every bit of space uh, somebody said we can turn a whole more things into garden mm -hmm. not just growing but simply planting there's a whole lot of space to be able to do that so that seemed really really quite important and and then attached to that was talking about the need to ensure that as adults we we create the pathway that then the children can follow and it's really making sure that we allow those children to have the connection with the nature and whether that's the nature trails or the walks or the growing or the community engagement around the growing and the food and all those things that go with it it's about making that connection and making sure the children have that from, from you know from very young onwards so that they develop and evolve that as well but that has to come from us we have to kind of push that from from the adult perspective as well Thanks, Vicky. Okay. That's great. Okay. Was it number seven? Yep, that was okay. me. Um, so we can keep it quite brief because yep. we had half an hour. <laughs> we, mostly, we mostly were talking about making things greener and having less cars and slowing the pace right down. Um, and we were wondering if we could all write to the council and say how much we were actually enjoying the fact that we weren't cutting the grass as much and destroying the weeds on the roads. Um, and pointing out that mostly they are, can be quite responsive. If people say it looks untidy, then they'll come and um, spray or cut. But if we say they like it as it is, then then that gives them positive feedback. And also, we should <laughs> there was one suggestion we should find more mussels to encourage the mussel growing, which would encourage kelp farming, which would um, do all of that. I like that. That's a good <laughs> good uh, point to finish on. There wasn't an eight, was there? No, no, no. Excellent. Wonderful. That's, that sounds like it was quite an um, energetic discussion. And I know it's always frustrating. There's never enough time to really explore all the ideas in depth. Um, but hopefully one thing that um, you might be able to do after, after this session finishes is to um, talk about this movie a bit more within our community, but also to others who maybe didn't manage to come um, and see it because really the mo one of the most powerful things you can do to make change happen is to normalize uh, the talking about and taking action on climate change. So please do mention this session to others. It's quite a powerful thing to do. Um, there's also other things you can probably do, and a lot of us are probably taking all the steps that we can think of, but 2040 Regeneration website has got this little portal. You can activate your personal action plan and learn more about the solutions as well. So if you Google that, um, that can be useful, especially if you have children. Um, uh, there's lots of materials they've got for school level um, stuff. But uh, we're also offering, as, as plant, we, we've been funded for the next two years, and we're offering a number of wo workshops and events you can get involved with um, to, you know, upskill yourself and make a change yourself. Uh, and um, we have a list of those in our evaluation form, so you can basically express your interest about them um, through filling in the evaluation form. I think that probably takes us pretty much to the end of the session. And um, thank you for staying on. Um, I knew it was going to extend because there's so much uh, stuff to discuss. And thank you for your patience with, with um, extended discussions. Um, I don't know if, um, if we usually do a big wave at the end of the session. So if you uh, go into a gallery view um, and activate your uh, camera and maybe do a big wave to uh, say, goodbye to everybody and I might take take a little photo of everybody as we're doing this that's fantastic thank you so much and thank you to all of our panelists and thank you to all the pan participants and all the fantastic helpers we've had today um, and hopefully we'll see you next time bye, bye. thank you Kashka thank you Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.